This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 28, recorded on March 1st. 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, Vincent. Hello, Elio. How are you today? How's the weather down there? It's, um, it was a icky day, and the sun has finally decided to peak out. Oh. Well, here it's horrible. Six degrees Celsius. Ooh. And cloudy, it has been raining this morning, not very nice. Let's see how the weather is out on the West Coast where we'll find Elio Schechter. Howdy, howdy. How are you doing there? Well, us Californians are always basking in the sun. (laughs) We're almost basking in the sun. There's some clouds up. We had some rain, actually, which is great. We need it. Wow. Well, there you go. That's why you left the East Coast, I guess. Not quite. (laughs) (laughs) Well, today we have, as usual, a couple of stories. But before we do that, Elio, I wanted to ask you something. You you wrote a nice piece about uh, this Lake Vladivostok. Not Vladivostok, Vostok. Vladivladi. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Vostok. <laughs> My knowledge of Russian. And you, they pierced it finally, right? That's right. But I remember you said it's going to be a while before they learn what kind of microbes are there. Why does it take so long? Well, um, they are not doing anything with it. They plug, they plugged it up. Oh, I see. And I think it has to do with the climate. You don't start messing around in the winter in Antarctica. I mean, this is the coldest place on Earth. Yeah. 85, 87 degrees centigrade. So they can't, I don't think they can work. But in addition, there was some safety issue having to do with, uh, I, I actually don't know. But there was, a, I think there's a technical reason why they have to wait a while. Meanwhile, the Brits and the Americans are trying to do the same thing on a different lake. Mm-hmm. And they're using a different procedure. The Americans and the British are actually melting the ice as they go along, which they think is a safer way of avoiding contamination. The Russians didn't do that. I think it's, it's, they used these chemicals to, to disinfect as they went along. So I don't, I don't know. This is so highly technical. Imagine hmm. under conditions which are impossible for survival, they are drilling thousands of meters down through the ice. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. something. And then they're going to take some water out and then look for microbes. I guess they're going to sequence it? Uh, I'm sure they're going to sequence it. I mean, they're going to meta- metagenomicize it. Yeah. Look at everything that's there. They're going to try to grow everything. They're going to put it under the microscope. Yeah, it's great. They're going to try to purify everything. They're going to f- do everything conceivable because every drop of that water is kind of precious. Yeah. It's been there for some millions of years, maybe. Actually, they could, they have, it's possible that some uh, ice makes waves and the movement of the ice may make some for some changes in the water content. Hmm. So it's not necessarily that old, but it's still plenty old. Should Good. be interesting, right? Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, we, we well, metagenomics has uh, said uh, we have a license to look for everywhere and anywhere. And so the more... <laughs> <laughs> the we more... have a license, yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, well, we'll talk about it here on Twin when it happens. The, the funny thing is that even though people like Norman Pace and many others have been looking absolutely everywhere they can, including under the grains of sand in the Antarctica desert, uh, the idea that the three d- great domains of life are all there is, it seems to have held up. There's no, nobody's come up with a fourth domain. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of interesting. What about another, on other planets? Is there life there? Right. Well, I, I want to change the subject okay. now. <laughs> I want to congratulate you, uh, Vincent, for having gotten a very nice award from the British Society for General Microbiology. Why don't you tell us about it? Uh, this is called the Peter Wildley Award. It's for microbiology teaching and education. So it is a award given every year. I believe, I believe Peter Wildley was a, was a virologist, and uh, it is to recognize people who do teaching. And uh, so this year there, I got it because I... Uh, I do these podcasts and blog, and uh, I wrote a textbook, and I, do, I teach an undergraduate virology course. All of that stuff, I suppose. 
So I was nominated and uh, I got it. So it's really nice. I get to go to the SGM meeting in Dublin, uh, which, which is at the end of this month. Oh. I give a talk and we're also doing a TWIV there. Nice. I am taking uh, Chris Condian with me and he's going to help uh-huh. out and we're going to he's try. He's the ASM. He is the guy, uh, the ASM. Heart and soul of the ASM communications committee. That's so. right. And then we will, uh, I'm trying to get Ron Fouchier to be on the TWIV with us, and he'll talk about his H5N1 oh, God. experiments in ferrets. So that should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. So I and think- that brings up the, the next topic. I was going through my email this afternoon, and we got the I got my table of contents alert for MBio, and I was scanning the titles, and I stumbled upon an article or a, an opinion written by you, Vincent, Science should be in the public domain, and I think it's responding to the editorial that is written by Arturo Casadevall and Tom Shank about the H5N1 manuscript redaction controversy. That's right. And it's a, it's a rather short, I recommend it to folks to, to read. It's a, it's a nice one-page article uh, that you can read fairly quickly, and it really puts into perspective when you read Vincent's article in concert with uh, Tom Shank and Arturo Casadevall's editorial, you really uh, can form your own opinion after uh, reading both of those uh, opinions as to whether or not um, the H5N1 manuscript should really be uh, put into the public domain or not. And of course, uh, since then, since that was written, WHO has said it should be published. So looks like it will be. And... uh We'll see what happens in the next month or two. All right, let's move on to papers. Now, gentlemen, one of these two papers actually follows very nicely from last week. Should we do that first? Would that be acceptable? Sure. That is, uh, it is called Within Host Competition Drives Selection for the Capsule Virulence Determinant of Streptococcus Pneumoniae. This was published in Current Biology, July of 2010. And I, I was the lucky one that is going to try to explain math to the listeners. Uh, and first off, I should point out that I am not a math person. Math has always been a, a challenge. I, I can do math when, when, when forced, but uh, this is an extreme. When you have to do your income, when you have to do your income tax, right? That's that's when <laughs> when I do it. Uh, this is actually, I think. Um, a primer that all um, I, I was having a conversation with a, a colleague of mine in the infectious disease division, and and I, after I read this paper and and was asked to talk about it this week, I said to her name is Dr. Cassie Salgado, and she's our hospital epidemiologist, and she runs our fellowship program in infectious diseases, and I said I I really think that modern ID physicians need to begin to think about this host competition. And this paper does have differential equations in it, but the good news is they're in the supplement. So don't get turned off by it. And the paper is really elegantly presented in terms that the novice uh, infectious disease physician, as well as the skilled infectious disease, you know, the the journeyman infectious disease physician, as well as microbiologists in general, can really appreciate because the studies that they use to develop their model are nothing more than viable counts. Hmm. And, And a viable count is where you effectively recover a sample and plate it on a Petri plate and ask a very simple question, how many bacteria are there? And I'm going to introduce the paper, the the way the authors introduce the paper, and paraphrasing them is uh, they ask the simple question, why do bacteria, who are parasites, kill their host? Hmm. Now, this is a question that microbiologists since the times of Pasteur who debunked spontaneous generation, and Koch, who proposed the germ theory of disease, have been struggling with. And the other thing to appreciate is that in the case of the two organisms that we're going to talk about today, Haemophilus influenzae and Streptococcus pneumonia, these 
microbes effectively seek out mucosal surfaces and they are the portal of entry. And in general, the mucosal surfaces are a good portal of entry for a lot of contagious microbes. I, I just recently caught up on the movies I needed to see from this past year and I, I watched Contagion and that movie starts by introducing um, in the character of uh, Dr. Aaron Mears, who is the CDC protagonist, who's played by Kate Winston, she effectively says that the average human touches their face 2,000 to 3,000 times per day, arguing for how um, that infectious virus is effectively going to amplify and move itself uh, amongst the population. And so I was very intrigued by that 2,000 to 3,000 number. So I started to ground truth that, and that doesn't appear that there's any real live data out there that (laughs) that supports that notion. And, um, you know, there was a board certified dermatologist who said, um, I see people all day and, um, I, I know for a fact that there's no way they could achieve that particular rate. But again, you have to go out and, and ground truth these sorts of things. But the mucosal surfaces for st- uh, streptococcus pneumonia and uh, haemophilus influenzae, of course, are the mucosal surface of the upper respiratory tract are where these microbes enter. And so what these authors investigated, and you know, this paper is from um, two years ago. So this is Elena Lysenko, Rebecca Lyak, Sam Brown, and Jeffrey Weiser. And they're from the Departments of Microbiology and Pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine that's in Philadelphia, as well as the Department of Zoology at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. And uh, Sam Brown is the one from um, Oxford. First, they introduce their experimental concept, and, and they're looking at the murine model of nasal colonization. So you develop a defined concentration of bacteria, and you inoculate the animal's nose, akin to the way we would uh, acquire pneumonia. And then, then they ask a very simple question about competition, uh, looking at strep pneumo and looking at homophilus influenza. One of the things that you have to sort of already know or, or buy into is that, and rather than saying the whole organism, I'm just gonna go to slang and call uh, it H. flu and the pneumococcal or pneumococcus. So H. flu produces a toxic peptide that actually can go off and uh, kill bacteria, principally the pneumococcus, And so recognize that there's going to be a little bit of a competition between the H. flu and the pneumococcus based on the fact that um, the H. flu produces this bactericin that will kill the bacteria and also appreciate the fact that we have a a live host that has a, a terrific functioning immune system and any first year med student or first year microbiologist appreciates that um, one of the principal virulence factors of strep pneumo is the fact that it has this wonderful thick polysaccharide capsule. And one of the dogmatic things that um, we recognize is that um, this capsule confers virulence because what it does is it lessens the ability of the neutrophil to effectively phagocytize the strep pneumo. And, you know, that's one of the hallmark um, unknown pictures that you, you give to, you know, the med student or, or uh, a dental student on an exam is you, you show this uh, sample that has neutrophils in it and these cute little Gram positive diplococci that are outside of the outside of the neutrophil, and you ask what's the virulence factor, and of course everybody immediately bubbles the capsule because it's not being effectively phagocytized. And you know, I think that's the classic question they always put on part one of the national boards for for 
med medical students. But the reason that the neutrophil has a, a struggle uh, phagocytizing the pneumococcus is because it's uh, got this polysaccharide and bacteria are, are negatively charged. And what has to happen is the neutrophil has to overcome that negative charge and they're negatively charged. So it's like when you were a little kid playing with the two poles of the magnet that are repelling one another. And so the way um, our immune system has dealt with it is they effectively go after and they conduct something called opsonic killing. And opsonic killing is nothing more than a factor that will associate with, in this case, the pneumococcus that will facilitate um, the immune system's ability to interact with the antigen. In this case, it happens to be um, the pneumococcus that's engulfed by the polysaccharide. And the way it's accomplished in um, our immune system is it's principally by the fact that complement will interact with that capsule and the complement opsonized pneumococci then are, of course can be engulfed by the neutrophils and the strep pneumos already causing a, a localized inflammatory response that is effectively recruiting the neutrophils. So is having the different, the thicker capsule confer resistance to this uh, opsonization? Uh, yes, and that's where this paper gets really neat. And um, I, I think, and you know, this is always subject to change because bacteria being bacteria can change their spots. Right now, I think there are about 92 different variants of polysaccharide capsules that pneumococci can express, and some are better at others at avoiding this complement. And of course, these authors have, like all good uh, microbiologists slash geneticists, they always have variants. And so they have a, a good pneumococcus that, you know, is really virulent and then or resistant to opsonic clearance. And then they have a mediocre one that's um, not so good at opsonic uh, killing. And so the, the virulent pneumococci express capsules that confer the resistance to the opsonic clearance. And of course, the vaccinologist has taken advantage of this by effectively taking the capsules from the more virulent ones. And there's different pneumococcal vaccines out that effectively... And they're called pneumovax, aren't they? They're mm -hmm. called pneumovax. And they what they do is they actually conjugate uh, protein, and it happens to be uh, a derivative from uh, diphtheria. They actually uh, take, um, it's, I think it's, if my neurons are remembering right, I think it's something like CRP, where it's, you know, CRM. It's diphtheria cross-reacting material. I'm remembering because I taught diphtheria about three weeks ago. So it's diphtheria cross-reactive material that's actually conjugated to these pneumovaxes, and there's a seven valent uh, pneumovax, and now there's a 23 valent wow. pneumovax. It's amazing. <laughs> and, you know, these things actually protect the general population. And if you happen to be an individual suffering from sickle cell disease, or you happen to be immune suppressed, or are pre. You have a disease called old age. <laughs> old age. I was just getting to my father. Yes, my, my dad, they're always trying to poke him with with uh, pneumovax, uh, and so consequently, uh, we understand now why what, what's actually going on. So they, they have um, two flavors of, of uh, the pneumococci. They have type 4, which, um, and I should point out that there's two types, type 4 and type 23. Both pneumococci will colonize mice just fine. Both We're talking will about the paper now. You're talking about the paper now, I'm right? talking about the paper now. Okay. And, and both will induce a, a mild inflammatory response. So how do you, I'm always asking my students, how do you know and how do you show? 
And so how do you know that both types, type 4 and type 23 of the pneumococci, induce a mild inflammatory response? And the simple answer is you look for infiltration of, of neutrophils, also known as uh, phagocytic cells. And so you can actually look for that the old-fashioned way by using a microscope or using a flow cytometer, and you can effectively look at what's going on. And Actually, the, you're looking at this in the alveoli, are you? Yes. You're looking at it outside the body, as it were. Correct. You're looking at for it outside the body, and that's effectively what modern medicine does is, you know, they, they'll get a sputum sample, and they'll put the sputum under a scope, and if you see these cute little diplococci that aren't inside neutrophils, you know that, you know, it's the classic hallmark for doing a diagnosis of pneumococcal pneumonia even before the culture comes back because that's one of the hallmarks. Now, the other thing to appreciate is that there's a greater than 10 to the 8-fold difference, 10 to the 8th meaning the number of bacteria required to cause an LD50 or a lethal dose 50 for these two particular strains following a systemic challenge. So a systemic challenge is you'll either inject the um, pneumococci, uh, probably IP, intraperitoneally. And so the greater virulent form of this pneumococci is the PR rather than um, the, the PS. And, and the type 4 happens to be the more virulent form of the pneumococcus that they're testing in their system, while the type 23 happens to be the lesser virulent of the form. Uh, as an aside, Michael, do they both uh, kill mice when injected intraperitoneally? Yeah, they do, do but, but uh, type 4, you need 10 to the 8th less bugs uh -huh. to cause the LD50. So 100 million is the differential. So that's a pretty big differential. Okay, because the irregular virulent pneumococcus, when injected intraperitoneally, will kill a mouse in 18 hours uh, when you inject, on average, one cell per mouse. And that's amazing. It's uh, something that we used to do with medical students to show them how, how bad it can be. This is why I think this is a one of these classic papers to begin to think about competition because they have a nice model system. It, it builds on concepts that are taught very early on in our understandings of, of how infectious diseases work and what is actually um, going on. And so the concept of, of the paper is that they're arguing that these different capsule types are antigenically distinct and they're the immunodominant constituent of the pneumococcal surface. And again, that makes intuitive sense. That's been known for a years. Lot. And it's assumed that the diversity of the capsule or types arose to effectively escape immune pressure in the host. And again, that's effectively one of the tenets of selective pressure that uh, we understand of how bacteria are continually adapting to the host. But then they make the argument, however, they say uh, only a few capsule types generally account for the overwhelming majority of both carriage, that is, you know, being a carrier of these pneumococcal strains, and disease isolates. And they, they argue that this is an unknown reason, which is the premise of their paper. They further go on to argue that there's, there must be a metabolic cost to produce large amounts of capsule or polysaccharide. After all, it's nothing but a lot of sugar. So eating sugar as opposed to storing sugar on, on your surface has to cons confer some fitness penalty. And the other, comp the other argument they make is the capsule may obscure surface molecules, such as adhesions that, adhesins that will uh, facilitate an interaction with the host. And so they ultimately suggest that the diversity of capsule types will be uh, explicable by a variation amongst the flora. 
And so they then go on to argue that in situations where there's a competitor, and in the competitor in this case is Haemophilus influenzae. And Haemophilus influenzae is, is highly prevalent in, in the niche, and it's highly immunomanipulative. And so that they anticipate that the selection would favor thicker capsule types that are more resistant to clearance by opsonic phagocytosis. And that's effectively what they demonstrate with type 4, the more virulent type. It's resistant to opsonic clearance by mediated by complement. And so their, they, their observations then will provide an explanation as to the evolution of a very potentially costly building a thicker capsule imposes a fitness cost because it's simply going to cost them more money if you will you think atp is money more money to invest in a a, a thicker wall it's sort of like putting insulation in your house now if i understand this the fact that these more virulent pneumococci happen to be more virulent, may cause more disease and kill the host, is incidental. Yes. The fact that they are competitive in terms of the flora, right? That's, that's yes. the idea. They, they don't mean to kill us. They don't mean so to It kill. happens that if they want to survive vis-a-vis With, H flu, they might as well kill us. And the way they do this, and, and this is what figure two does in a very interesting and and straightforward manner, uh, specifically figure 2B. And they have this competition experiment set up, and their readout is simply the number of cells that they recover from the lavage. And they have the, the sensitive one uh, versus the resistant one. And 4 is the resistant one, and 23 is um, the sensitive one. And they put... This is resistant and sensitive to opsonization. Correct. Right? Okay. So what they do is they add the competitor in figure 2B. And so when they add H flu to the sensitive one, you see a statistically significant drop in the concentration of bacteria or H flu is actually facilitating if you will, the trimming or the weeding back, while the um, resistant one in the presence of H flu, there's really no um, difference uh, between the the, the PR the, or the resistant one uh, versus um, the in the, in the presence of H flu. And then Figure Three. Uh, hold on a second. I, I won't argue the quality of the data. It's certainly what they got, and it's statistically significant. But frankly, the effect is not huge. Oh, no. Yeah. You're uh, still going to yeah. be it's dead. It's not a huge effect, right? You're still going to no. be dead uh, if you follow the virulence model uh, right. that we teach our students about how many pneumococci does it take to kill a mouse. And th- this this study was, after all, done it, done in mice. But Yeah, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an intranasal thing, which is quite different than what we know. What. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And then what figure three does is they actually, and starting off with figure 3B, is they have, again, their control in, in the wild type, and then they have uh, a mutant that happens to be, um, it has a, um, they use a knockout mouse called the MAC1 mouse that, um, it has a particular genetic lesion um, that it's a CD11B, CD18 mouse, which is the MAC-I double knockout. Uh, and what it effectively demonstrates is that um, the need for this opsonization by the neutro- uh, facilitation by complement and the need for the neutrophil in order to opsonize these things. And they go through a, a series of controls where they add a cobra venom derivative to effectively deplete the complement. And then they have a monoclonal antibody treatment that removes the neutrophils. And what it effectively does is eliminates the opsonization of 
this particular thing. And, you know, I, I struggled with trying to um, explain their differential equation so they will be understandable on a, a podcast. And I, I think <laughs> the best way to do that is encourage those of you interested in the modeling to really go and look at the supplement where they really begin to talk about rate changes and the differential equations aren't all that complicated. They have the H flu is designated as H and the strep pneumo, uh, which is sensitive to optimization as PS and the resistant is, uh, which is the type four is, is R. And it's, it's really no different from the classic growth curve differential equation that we all learned when we were studying and thinking about bacterial growth. And rather than butcher it on on the podcast, I would encourage you, if interested, to take a look at it. And But the, the take-home message is that um, what they were able to demonstrate, uh, both through a theoretical model, which is figure one, and the experimental demonstrations, which are figures two, three, and four, is that capsule, the capsule virulence determinant confers a selective advantage during colonization and then helps to enable that microbe to persist during mucosal inflammation that is induced by competitive interactions amongst the flora. And the competitive interaction in this particular case happens to be the H flu. And it's a, it's a nice binary model that they're introducing to really begin to give us an ability to think about this dynamic competition. And over the last few podcasts, we've been talking about the microbiome and, and looking at things like uh, autism and bacteria in the gut. And this paper, I think, will help those individuals trying to look for a cause and effect a way of beginning to think about designing experiments that can help them look at whether Sutterella is a, a cause or a consequence that's associated with uh, autism in you know the gut of those children. And so this paper is is really um, an interesting way to begin to help train your mind to begin to think about these things in a very elegant and yet simple to understand because viable counts are easy to wrap our heads around. We're not looking at sequences disappearing. We're not looking at messages. We're, we're effectively looking at real numbers of bacteria that we can count with our finger on a Petri plate. So, Michael, this is uh, using H. flu as the competitor, but in reality, it could be other bacteria applying the competition, right? Right, and the reason they used H. flu is because it makes a bactericin that really mm -hmm. interacts, and you know, it's a small grenade that these other things pull. And the other interesting thing about H. flu is, again, we've developed vaccines for H. flu that are specifically targeting their capsules, and we've effectively eliminated H. flu. Uh, as a problem pathogen for small children, uh, simply because of the vaccination. It's called the Hib vaccination, I think, if I'm remembering right. And uh, the only age influenza flu, type B is what it means. That's right. And the only ones that we're seeing uh, H flu as in, in the clinics these days are the ones that are non capsulated because the vaccine, frankly, works. Yeah. So, Michael, the um, the H flu induces this neutrophil expansion, which then provides a, a, a break for the uh, strep pneumonia, and that's why we select for encapsulated ones, so the strep pneumonia can, uh, can escape that. So, doesn't the strep pneumonia on its own induce um, the, a, an immune response to which it must respond as well? Why does it have to be the uh, the other bacterium that is doing that. There, you know what I, I mean? think it's because they, they wanted to model the thickness of the capsules. And it's it's the capsule type because there's a subset of strep pneumo 
that is represented by um, being the virulent form of, of pneumococcus. Yeah. And it's the thicker capsule that is more resistant to complement mediated opsonization, which is sort of like a double because opsonization complement facilitates the opsonic engulfment of, of the um, uh, strep pneumo. And the thicker the mm-hmm. capsule, the less likely it's to be, quote, opsonized by, by the complement. It's hmm. it's really um you know it 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 brings home both the innate immune response and you know there's a whole group of folks out there that really wonder if complement is good for anything uh, <laughs> and you know then there are others that are arguing strongly that if you know complement was not good for anything we would have long deleted that from our repertoire of our innate immune system. So I think this is also driving home the importance of complement, especially in these conditions where you're having neutrophils uh, actively engulf things. So the bottom line is that strep pneumonia has to make thicker capsules to compete with Haemophilus. In this particular model, yes, it's Haemophilus, but in general, it may be thicker capsules for other things. Well. There is so much more to the pneumococcus and, and to H flu. Uh, I'm actually reminded of something which paradox- is a little bit paradoxical, namely that it, I think pneumococcus tends to kill H flu by making hydrogen peroxide. Mm-hmm. The, the odd thing is that pneumococcus is exquisitely sensitive to the hydrogen peroxide it makes. And if you mm-hmm. remember, I'm sure Michael can tell you about this, and you must have seen this in colonies of pneumococcus on agar, tend to be sort of dimpled, like they have a, a belly button on the colony. Yes. And the reason is that the cells lice. used to be thought they lice because of an autolysin, but it turns out that hydrogen peroxide plays a big role in killing them. Mm. And, and by the way, it is so hard to keep a culture of pneumococcus going in the lab that if you're not careful, you're going to lose it. So you have to transfer it at least once a month, if not more so. And let me tell you a better way of doing it, if I may. Mm-hmm. This is something that somebody figured out. Since pneumococcus I killed mice very easily, most virulent ones certainly, when you introduce them intraperitoneally, all you have to do is to take the mice when it's dead and put it in the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> and when you want the pneumococcus, you just dissect the mouse, go to the peritoneal cavity, and out pops the pneumococcus. <laughs> mm. So we great. had a collection of frozen mice as a oh way of my. keeping our culture collection going. That's great. That's positively brilliant. Well, I guess this, um, it's a, it's, as you say, Michael, it's a simple binary system, but it's got to be more complicated in the real world. Oh, no. And but, that's why I'm encouraging people to use it as a way of, of beginning to learn and really begin to, and, and figure one uh, in the uh, supplement uh, talks about the capsule cost versus the immunomanipulation. And I haven't really wrapped my head around the supplemental figure one. It It's a really interesting graph and you really have to work the math to really understand what's going on. And I had just haven't had an opportunity to, to work the math to a level and of extent where I'm comfortable enough that I won't. We want you to, we want you to go home and spend the rest of the afternoon doing math. <laughs> well, I did that. I did that last night, and I was really intrigued. But then it got laid in my brain. You know. Well, you know, I think the the experiments in this paper are fine. You, sure. you know, the models make a prediction, but they actually test them. And yeah. You you don't really yeah. need to do anything but look at the experiments. Right. I think they're quite nice. All right. Thank you, Michael. Let's move on to our second paper, uh, and this is uh, an article in um, FEMS Microbiology Reviews by Ingerson Mahar and. Jitai, do you say it that way? I think so. Gitai or Jitai? Uh, Gitai, Gitai? probably. A growing family, the expanding universe of the bacterial cytoskeleton. This, uh, so, Elio, this was really new to me. I thought bacteria were bags of enzymes. <laughs> Aha! <laughs> he says that with, um, yes. Being uh, the virologist that he is. This virologist, <laughs> right. I never heard of a bacterial cytoskeleton. Well, this is almost a paradigm shift or as I'm fond of saying, maybe a paradigm shiftlet. It's a significant change in our view of what bacterial structure is like. 
For some time now, almost almost 30 years, it's been known that there are in bacteria certain proteins which are act and look like cytoskeleton proteins in eukaryotes. So that this um, this is another element of the distinction between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, which has fallen off. Uh, they they tend to fall off, but I still think that basically the distinction is totally valid. Anyhow, it's another subject. Right now, let's go back 30 years or so. Um, people started to look at um, essential phenomena in bacteria by doing um, by using mutants which were uh, the mutant which were expressed under one condition and not under another condition. The typical one was temperature sensitive mutations. At a permissive temperature, the cells would grow. At a non-permissive temperature, they wouldn't grow. So now you could study them. And there was a guy named name of Willie Donaghy in uh, Edinburgh who decided to use this principle to study cell division. And he wasn't the only one, but there were, uh, he came up with a large collection, maybe at least a dozen different uh, genes were involved that if, when mutated gave you a temperature-sensitive phenotype in cell division, meaning the cells would grow, but they would grow as filaments. And this class of mutants was called FTS, filamentation temperature-sensitive, and they were studied, and everybody agreed that this is complicated. There's a lot of genes involved. And uh, the nice part is that one of Donaghy's students, um, namely Joe Lichtenhaus, who is now at the University of Kansas Medical School, decided to look into one of these things. And this was called FTSZ. I guess it was the last in the series. <laughs> so he looked at FTSZ, and sure enough, you grow E. coli, this is an E. coli, you grow it at uh, higher temperatures than, 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 than the permissive one, about 40 degrees, 42 degrees, you get filamentation, at 30 degrees you get normal cells. He looked at the protein and they isolated, they, they purified the protein and um, they came up with a startling result. That if you looked at ultra-thin sections, this is how things were done in those days before fluorescent, green fluorescent protein, fusions and things like that. You, you made ultra-thin sections and you treat them with antibodies to which you conjugated gold particles. Mm -hmm. When they did that, they found that the FDSC antibody localized to the septa of the cells. Okay, that's interesting. In fact, I, I asked Joe, uh, how did they come up with that idea? It was, it was really totally novel to look for localization of proteins in ultra-thin sections. Not many people were doing that. He says, well, they had the protein purified, so what do you do when you have a protein purified? It doesn't have an enzymatic activity, nothing you can measure readily. So you make antibodies to it. Okay, so now you inject a bunny with it, you get antibodies. Now what do you do? <laughs> you look to see where it is. You look and see where it is using gold conjugate. Okay, so FTSC um, is a protein that has uh, the magic property of being an analog of tubulin. Now, I'll remind you that cytoskeletal proteins in eukaryotes, in a classic sense, which is changing very, very rapidly, consisted of three classes, actins, tubulins, and a thing called intermediate filaments. Not only have we found all three, have people found all three in bacteria and archaea cells, not necessarily in the same cell, I should point out, but a whole raft of other cytoskeletal proteins which are have been found in, um, in uh, eukaryotic cells have also been found in uh, or analogs or similar things or analogous things have also been found in prokaryotes. So let me go a little bit over this. It's um, as I said, it becomes an alphabet soup of, of genes and an alphabet soup or a, a large dictionary of terms. So we, uh, I, I hope the listeners are not getting too impatient when I sling around terms like this. Anyhow. Uh, FTSZ is a structural protein, a cytoskeletal protein, which is the finest proteins in this paper, and I think it's a good definition. They say a cytoskeletal protein is one that has the ability to polymerize into linear filaments and play a structural or regulatory role in promoting cellular organization. Well, that's pretty broad, but the polymerizing into filaments seems to be the basic thing, and there are really oodles of proteins that can do that. FTSC does it 
in a particularly interesting way. They, um, it seems to be recruited specifically to the site of the self cell division, the site of the septum. And these are sort of molecules that start out life as being fairly linear. They stick to the membrane. And when they uh, hydrolyze a GTP, which many of these proteins do, they become curvy. And the curving of the protein makes for a, a ring structure that grows and grows and grows and it's narrower until it becomes a, the equivalent, well, it becomes some, the place where the two cells divide, the, cells divide, the cell divides into two. Into two. Um, so the constrictive force seems to be generated by moving from a linear conformation to a bent conformation. Sounds simple enough, but it's certainly not that simple. And of course, there are lots of other proteins which are involved. In fact, FTSE ring, as the structure is called, recruits a whole mess of other proteins, which in the aggregate are called the divisome. The divisome is the aggregate of all the proteins involved in cell division, which is a lot of these other FTS proteins that I alluded to. So that is one, and it's become a classic. So let me say, let me stay with it because it's actually the exceptions that are probably more interesting. FDSE is highly conserved. It's found in most bacteria, in most, many archaea. However, uh, oh, and by the way, it works on liposomes. This is really neat. Uh, um, uh, Erickson at Duke uh, who's uh, Harold Erickson, who's and uh, Masaki Osawa have done a lot of work on FTSE, and they show that if they put it in liposomes, the liposomes divide. If you give them mm. GTP, okay, so that's kind of nice. So they're they're constricting and they're that, constricting uh, a liposome, so, right? They're, they're making wow. a liposome to cell division. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay. So why, where are they not found? That's let me, let, it's funny to go into things uh, in a negative way, but let me tr let me try because it's interesting. There's really quite a few bacteria which don't have them. And main ones are chlamydia, which are intracellular parasites, uh, strict intracellular parasites, and so are some of the uh, insect endosymbionts. They're kind of small. They don't have FTSC. Some of them do, some of them don't. The planktomycetes, this is a very strange group of bacteria that we're going to have to talk about sometime. They're sort of the outliers if in many, many, many ways. They're outliers in this sense as well. They have no FTSC. And mycoplasma. Some have it and some don't. And the mycoplasma that have FTSC can do without it. In other words, if you make a deletion, the cells divide fine. Hmm. Now, let me stay with mycoplasma because I'm changing the subject completely, but this is so neat I have to do it. Okay with you? Can I do that? That's yeah, fine. Permission? Yeah. Granted? Sounds good. Okay. So, mycoplasma, as you know, are cell wall-less bacteria. They, they, are the right, they belong to the gram positives, but they have a structure all of their own. They are like essentially almost like little amoebas. That's stretching the point. It's not quite right, but they are not... Uh, regular sh is regular shaped, they're not rod shaped and so forth. They tend to be bleb like. Now they do one thing which is extraordinary. They have a at one of their sides, one of their ends, a structure called a uh, it's called a terminal organelle or attachment organelle. So they are imagine uh, God, those of us who are very old and remember Al Cap uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you remember Al Cap and uh, do, Lee Dabner uh, comic strips? Sure, sure. Yeah. This, uh, in an entity called a shmoo. That's a shmoo, right. Yeah, yeah, of course. A pear-shaped organism whose role was to make people happy. Remember that yeah. they would drop that to make people happy. But these, cars, these look like shmoos, okay? They look like a, a pear. And the pear, the, the uh, thin end of the pear is called a terminal organelle. This terminal organelle sticks to surfaces and pulls from there, the, 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 the rest of the cells is pulled along by gliding motility. Okay? Mm. So that's what they do. They do they say it's a form of motility like a bleb. Uh, it's, it's like a slinky toy, actually. It's sort of yeah. Kind of like that. Not quite, but kind of like that. Anyhow, uh, in FDSC less um, uh, mycoplasma, the, this proceeds fine. And so the idea is, and this is a paper. Uh, it is a fine review paper, which we ought to add to the to the notes by Erickson and Masai called Cell Division Without FTSE, 
a variety of redundant mechanisms. So they propose that traction mediates cytokinesis, that is cell division. Anyhow, let me not go on to that because there is there are other versions of things which which um, uh, where you can divide without the FDSC. However, FDSC seems to be a pretty good thing, and it may have been one of the very earliest things to to appear on evolution. So, uh, in fact, the case can be made that um, eukaryotes didn't invent cytoskeletal proteins, prokaryotes did, because these proteins yeah. were probably in existence before the emergence of eukaryotes. So like everything else, it all started with, my, with, with prokaryotes, right? You know, it's funny you say that because this article... This article is written to say, "Oh, we found this, which is like the eukaryotic one, and this is like." But in fact, they were there first. <laughs> it should be backwards. But what happened is yeah. that for a change. Now, I'll give I'll give the eukaryotists this much: that they were there much first with their understanding of cytoskeleton than than the bacteriologists were. Why do you think that is? Why was that? Oh boy, um, it's a good question. I think um, meiosis. You think? Because people were investigating mitosis, meiosis? Yeah, mitosis, I think. Because you can you can easily see actin, uh, tubulin filaments in, my, in the mitotic mm. spindle. The mitotic spindle invites the idea that there's got to be structures there in the form yeah. of tubules of some sort. So I think that's what, probably what it was. And the, the, <laughs> I, I was involved as a, as a way back as a student in the discussion of how uh, the bacteria nucleoid device it was uh, thought that it devised by mitosis that didn't last very long because it doesn't. But anyhow, uh, things are more complicated in bacteria because they are simpler. <laughs> when you when mm. you think about it, uh, this is a digression. I think of the um, uh, of a eukaryotic cell as being like the Queen Elizabeth, the great big ship in which there is dedicated systems. There's a bridge, there's a dining room, there is an engine room, there is all kinds of stuff, all dedicated. If you have a very, go back to the earliest satellites that were put on, on in, in space, they were tiny, they were small, and they had to have multifunctionality. That is, you couldn't just devote a system to one thing, it had to do many things. Well, hmm. pro prokaryotic cells are a little bit like that. They are... Uh, they have redundant, not only redundancy, but they also have multifunctionality. You make use of everything you can in as many ways as you can. So that makes it harder to study. That actually, I mean, genetics uh, sometimes falls by the wayside because you're you're looking at the wrong um, uh, at the wrong phenomenon. You're, you're, you're thinking your the mutation is in X. Well, it's in X, all right. It's Y and Z that count. So pleiotropic effects reign in prokaryotes mm -hmm. and makes it difficult. That's my answer. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, let me go back. So much for FDSC. The next thing that comes up, which is really neat, is a protein called MREB. Uh, and I think I don't I don't remember what MREB stands for, but let's just live with it. I, I used to know. It's, a, it's meals ready to eat, right? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, it, what happens is if you have a mutation in MREB, notice this is not an FTS uh, class of mutants. They are not mutants that make filaments. What they make instead is blobs. It becomes spherical, and you find that. MREB homologs I found in most but not all rod shaped bacteria, not necessarily in spherical shaped bacteria. So, this is a protein which has something to do with making shapes, with making mm. rods being rods. Mm -hmm. And it is, of all things, an analog of actin. The interesting part about this, it's an aside, but it's an important aside. If you look for homology, you find that the homology between MREB and whatever actin you look at is very small, less than 30%. However, mm -hmm. if you look at the structure, they're overlapping. And this is, of course, something that everybody now knows, that sequence gazing isn't nearly as good as structure gazing. In other words, you can be totally fooled by having two proteins with very distinct, different homologies, but having the same or an equivalent structure. So these are... Uh, very much uh, in the actin family. And there's lots of them. And some are, interesting enough, um, 
we, we discussed tangentially one of them when we discussed the magnetic bacteria because the protein in magnetic bacteria that forms filaments, MAMK, is, a, is related to MREB. In addition, and, and so that we know at least one function for, for an MREB-like protein, acting like protein, it forms filaments of uh, magnetosomes in magnetotactic bacteria. What else does it do? Well, some of the best studies, bacterial actins are actually coded by plasmids. And what do they do there? Well, it looks like they are involved, sure enough, in the partition of plasmids. They're called PAR, the name hmm. of the protein, PAR-M, is the typical one. And um, PAR-R is another one. And so there's all kinds of PAR proteins which have to do with partition. And when you think about it, this is what polymerization and depolymerization, I didn't say that, that cytoskeletal proteins not only polymerize, they depolymerize. So they push and pull, as it were. When you polymerize, you push. When you depolymerize, you pull. So in this, in this way, PAR proteins are thought to be involved in um, plasmid formation. They're also found, of all things, in phages. Now, what do they do in phages? And that's really kind of a mystery. We really, I, I don't think I know much about it. What, do they have a role in the bacteria themselves? And the answer is most likely. There are um, acting like proteins which look like they, are, they, they play a role in cell division or in the partition of the nucleus. I think it's way too early to really make a definitive statement about that. Then I'll mention one more. Can I mention one more? And then I'll, sure. I'll stop the, um, sure, sure. the uh, uh, cytoskeletal protein parade. Okay. In uh, Colobacter, Colobacter, if you remember, is a very interesting bacterium that has an interesting life cycle in that when it divides, it divides asymmetrically. One of the daughter cells makes a stalk, and that stalk sticks like a hole fast to whatever mm -hmm. surface there is. And the other one sprouts a flagellum and swims away. So this is this bug has the best of all worlds. It can both sit in one place, occupy the place, which may be very good for survival, or it can go swimming away looking for new places. But the point here is that it's curved. It's like a vibrio. It's a, it looks like a, band, a banana, hmm. that shape. Uh, anyhow, the, um, so what makes it curvy? And the answer is it has a protein, a cytoskeletal protein, called crescentin. And crescentin is a protein which bends. And by bending it and sticking to the membrane, it gives this the bend, the bend shape. So wow. that's really pretty neat. I could why, go... Uh, why does it have to be bent? Do we understand? Ah, I, yes, I, well, no, we, not that we understand. It's one of those questions. That's a Talmudic question. Yeah. But <laughs> the idea is that if you're bent, you move better to liquids than if you're straight. I see. By the way, if you, it's very simple. If you, if you mutate the protein, what, what you have, you have a straight callbacker. Yeah. If you put the, the crescentin into other bugs, what do they make? They make uh, curves. Curve. Um, so if you mutate the callbacker and they become unbent, does that have any cost? To the bacterium? Uh, you would ask. You would. I, ask. I don't know. I, I bet it doesn't swim as well, right? It, it, it probably swim. does have a cost, and you could probably measure it yeah, by looking I, I mean, at their chemotactic um, budget of of what's actually going on. It's okay. Just uh, wondering, but we should get a colobacter person here sometime. Oh, and absolutely, that would, would be, be fun. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, there's lots more. There's whole other families. Can I just mention them? There's yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Cyt Walker A cytoskeletal ATPases. Yeah. For those of you who know what the what the Walker A motif is, it's a motif for binding ATP in certain proteins. And these, uh, this is again cytoskeletal proteins by the definition. Then there are proteins called SCE. I'm sorry, ESCRT. I don't know if you say it. Escort. That stands for endosomal sorting complex required for transport. Okay. Right. And there are in that both archaea and bacteria equivalents of that. And then there's a class of proteins called bactophilins, which is kind of new. And now, the last thing I'll mention is that there are metabolic enzymes, such as uh, the enzyme that makes uh, CTP, 
mm-hmm. from UTP, ATP, and glutamine. And that protein makes filaments. And it is and it localizes along in colobacter along the inner curvature of the crescent shaped colobacter. Mm-hmm. In other words, mm-hmm. it interacts, in fact, probably with crescentin. So the authors of this paper, uh, Ingerson, Marr, and Gatai, uh, propose that uh, cytoskeletal proteins may have arisen uh, as metabolic proteins, and they learn how to polymerize for reasons of their own. And when they did that, some went one way, some went the other way, and some retained both functions. Hmm. So the evolution of these proteins is something that we will hear much more about. All I can say at this point is, there's lots of details available already, but the big picture needs to be fleshed out. And I believe I, I would advise everybody to tune in on cytoskeletal proteins in prokaryotes. Yeah, this is very cool. I had no idea there were so many. Um, I knew that bacteria were not just bags of, uh, of enzymes anymore. But uh, in fact, here in this article, they say at one point that was thought to be the case. Right. But a, a, and more recently, now these are discovered by sequencing, right? You sequence a genome and you discover these proteins, and then you can do experiments to to tag them with fluorescent proteins and see where they are, Precisely. and you can start to study them. Precisely. So you have a big arsenal of techniques now. So and by the way, and not the least of it is that fluorescent microscopy has really come of age, and it's yeah. can be done at exquisite levels of resolution. Right. Uh, the early papers were messy as can be. I mean, really, they, they, they saw blobs, and that was it. Now, there's real detail to be seen in the protein localization and, and what they do. Mm-hmm. So, Elio, would you say that this is a, a growing area in oh, the field? Oh, no, Vincent. You didn't say that, <laughs> did you? <laughs> Surely, Vincent, if you were starting out as a bacteriologist instead of a virologist, you would, you would consider working in this area. No question about it. Um, it's a co- see, what, 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 is, what happens is this brings together a lot of really wonderful developments. Uh, structural biology, which has become, mm-hmm. if not commonplace, it's become a regular thing. I understand it's done by robots. Uh, you don't make crystals by yourself. You have a robot making them for you, and you put those under an X-ray machine. Um, the bioinformatics that's behind it is powerful beyond measure. So you can not just know you know the structure, but you know what it's related to. You know what family the, the protein belongs to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All this is commonplace, combined with the. Uh, advances in microscopy. Uh, not only optical microscopy, but the also sci- uh, cryotomography in the electron microscope, all of which lets you study these things not in the isolation that you would have. You know, people used to think that if you study structures, you look in the microscope and that's it. Well, now you do all kinds of things. And the pe- the papers are just rich, rich in their usage of wonderful technology. Yeah, it's amazing. I... Uh it makes colony forming unit assays pale in some ways, but we still have to do those, of course. But remember, you can't have colony forming units without FTSZ That's right. and MERB <laughs> and all of these other things. Yeah, of course. But I, I just find it as an old timer, I find it humbling that the technology is so incredible. And um, mm. I started out doing simple assays, and I still do simple assays, but this is amazing. So this is a great article because it's written with a, a sense of wonderment. There's so much here that I, I highly recommend that everyone take a look at it. It's really an eye-opener. I like it. <laughs> Can I actually, speaking of, of good writing, let me, let, me, let me read a sentence yeah. from the other paper. This is the paper on cell division without FTSE by Erickson and Ozawa. Uh, <laughs> they say the following... Uh, they, they say that uh, when people found that chlamydia have no FTSZ, uh, they say enthusiasts of FTSZ could hold out some hope for its primacy <laughs> by thinking that these obligate parasites may use some host machinery for division. In other words, there may have been an out. Turns out there wasn't because there were free living archaea that also lacked it. But this kind of writing, I think, is uh, maybe uh, maybe we're blessed by having people who can write this way. Yeah, it's always good to have that. It's a plus. It's not always there, though. Right. All right. That's great. Thank you, Elio, for that. Uh, let's uh, answer a couple of email here. Uh, the first one is from Daniel, who writes, I would like to point out that the idea of 
Fitness Factors was originally published by Brousseau et al. 2004 and did not originate from Michael Schmidt, as was suggested in your last podcast. And he provides a link to an article uh, in which it's called Phages and the Evolution of Bacterial Pathogens. And indeed, the author does talk about fitness factors and virulence. Um, so we thank you, uh, Daniel, for doing that. And he, and he uh, points out, I think it's important to keep all forms of scientific information as accurate as possible. And since your podcast is likely heard by students and perhaps lay people who might not check the accuracy of claims as often as a scientist may, I bring this to your attention so that you can publicly set the record straight. I listen to all three of your podcasts and find two of them of high distinction. TWIP in particular is excellent, and TWIV generally deserves an honorable mention. TWIM, on the other hand, is not so well developed for accuracy or claims of originality. When I heard the fitness factors comments, I immediately recalled this paper and its citation in many subsequent papers. The way it's presented on the podcast made it sound as though it was your colleague's idea. Clearly, this is not the case. Uh, well, we well, first, let me say let me say one thing first. Yeah, uh, I am. The paper he refers to by Brusso is a magnificent paper, and I read it, and I had it in mind, and I apologize. I'm the guy who made a big fuss about uh, Michael bringing up the term fitness factors, and I, you know, I, I had plain forgotten that Brusso had used it before, and I didn't quite mean, uh, although I, I got carried away, and I said this sounds like something that um, you just, just came up here. Uh, I uh, I shouldn't have said that, but on the other hand, this happens. But I think it brings up a, a, a good point. Um, you know, we're having uh, a conversation, and I think many of our listeners wonder how we how we do these podcasts. And w- typically what happens is, at least as I prepare for the podcast, is I, I read the manuscript and I read the associated references often that in areas that I don't understand. And as we were discussing the particular paper, um, I was reacting to the conversation. And uh, the paper that was cited was from 2004, and I may or may not have read it back in 2004. But it's it's one of those things where your your brain has all of these facts, and it's it's how you uh, effectively uh, synthesize things in, in conversation. So I think it's a, a good thing for our students to appreciate is. You know, you, you know, life is cumulative, and so you actually do remember everything. You just may not remember where. And if we were <laughs> referencing our podcast, what we would do is we would have taken fitness factors and, and done an appropriate literature search, and we would have then immediately discovered uh, the fact that this, this uh, concept was originally published in Microbiology and Molecular Biology uh, Reviews from in 2004, and we would have uh, attributed uh, Brousseau and his colleagues uh, for coming up with that concept. But, you know, that's, that's the difference between doing a, a live event as opposed to uh, having an opportunity to, um, you know, ground truth everything. So we appreciate... Um, Dr. Guerrera's uh, comments and Guerra, we do Guerra. Guerra. We do try to be as accurate as as possible, but again, it's a spot. Even including his name, including pronouncing in, his name, right? Yes. <laughs> and I apologize for that as well. Well, thanks for pointing it out. It, but it is a conversation, and as such, it's casual, and uh, it is not a formal publication. We're going to make errors, so when you pick them up, point them out. We're happy to to have them pointed out to us. It's not a problem. And I think that's what we're losing in science today is is discourse. Uh, this was good discourse that w- that we had during the podcast, and and this is actually a, a great opportunity to to help our our listeners understand how the sausage is, if you will, made. You know, it's it's a series of ideas, and you know, who was it said there there are no original ideas any longer. Hmm. It's all, you know, uh, you know, you're building on, you're, you're, you're on the shoulders of giants in the past and you're, you're building because science is a, a cumulative activity. You know, th- this is, that's a good point. This is a discourse. This is the, these are the kind of conversations we have here in our labs and workplaces. And one of the things we try to do on these podcasts is to have them in a way that we can record them and show everyone how we interact. So when we have discussions here, we're not always right. We say the wrong things. So uh, this is just a slice of our lives 
really. All right, the next one is from Cam, who writes, uh, I am a third-year medical student at the University of Cambridge, currently doing a BA in parasitology, parasitism, immunology, and microbiology. I recently discovered TWIP et al. and am now harboring a full-scale addiction from my girlfriend. I have a couple of questions and suggestions relevant across the TWI platform. I've just finished listening to TWIM25. I found the discussion of magnetotactic bacteria fascinating, especially as I am also a technophile. So the prospect of a bacteria-powered smartphone blew me away. (laughs) On the question of where to find soil inhabiting magnetotactic bacteria, perhaps industrial sites that produce large electromagnetic fields would be a good place to start. Big electricity transformers, power stations... I was also interested by the discussion of TDR-TB, totally drug-resistant TB. I'm currently writing my dissertation on human infection with bovine TB, which is increasingly recognized as a misnomer. Mycobacterium bovis is generally intrinsically resistant to pyrazinamide and often carries resistance to isoniazid, both both first-line human TB drugs. Given that there is no good way of differentiating M. bovis and M. tuberculosis infection without culture and PCR, I would suggest that M. bovis infection in humans has played an as yet unquantified role in poor management of TB infection that has led to the development of resistance. However, there is very little data on what proportion of TB infection can be ascribed to M. bovis infection, with reports ranging from 0% Brazil to 21% Tanzania, in lymphadenopathy patients. To compound this, it is suggested that there is a large degree of underreporting of M. bovis because labs are not using pyruvate supplemented media to culture, preventing its growth. The aim of my dissertation is to identify antigens that could be used for differential diagnosis in resource poor settings, like by card test, where the majority of M. bovis infection seems to be found. Wow. Well, oh my, I must say, I learned more, more from this than I have from. Many of our own podcasts. <laughs> yeah, this was outstanding. This good stuff. Outstanding. Also, in Twim25, Peter's letter discussed the role of the microbiome in mosquito attraction. Michael Schmidt replied that it was unfortunately smelly, short chain fatty acids produced by bacteria that would likely be the repellent. However, in my biology of parasitism class taught by Dr. Sheila Lloyd, we were taught that Anopheles gambiae are attracted to Limburger cheese which contain Brevibacterium linens that produces short-chain fatty acids and is closely related to Brevibacterium epidermis on the skin. Similarly, Carinibacterium and Melisazia species on the skin also metabolize triglycerides to short-chain carboxylic fatty acids that are attractive for A. gambiae. The other main attractants to mosquitoes, depending on the species, are carbon dioxide, lactic acid, acetone, 1-octithriol, and nonanol. Wow. Cool. Something right. that I did not know. He has two specific questions. While I recognize that the three Twee shows are increasingly showing more overlap, I wondered whether there was room for a fourth niche. Oh, it would boy. Be great. It would be great <laughs> if you could produce a podcast in the Twee format that focuses on immunology, whether looking at the subject as a whole or more specifically uh, the interactions between infection and immunity rather than autoimmunity, cancer, and pregnancy. I think this subject area would provide an essential underpinning to the wide and varied discussion found on your current podcast. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this week in infectious immunity. <laughs> I, I think it's a good idea, Cam. I've been thinking about it. I have some colleagues uh, in mind, and maybe one day uh, we can do that. I'm very interested in immunology, of course, with the interface of infection, so it will likely happen. Thank you again for the sustained propagation of scientific values through your podcast, and in particular, making parasites accessible and exciting. It is a good antidote for an unfortunately common attitude that restricts the unilluminated to a reaction of disgust and aversion, when in actuality the lives of these parasites demonstrate a beauty and elegance beyond the most highly choreographed ballet. Boy, he's not kidding. I think that he's absolutely right. Incredible interest in the life cycles of parasites, just the total treasure trove of biological phenomena that we normally don't deal with much. You bet. All right, let's read one more. This one is from Josh, uh, and he writes, Hello, Twimmers. I have been slowly trying to catch up with Twim from the beginning, and my memory was jogged by one of the letters at the end of Twim 13, 
suggesting a collaboration between TWIM and an astrophysics podcast. I read an article in Popular Science recently about the extraterrestrial arsenic bacterium, and he Ooh. provides a link. Ooh. And the article left me with more questions than answers. It would be great to hear your thoughts on the matter. I would love to hear you guys talk about it in a future podcast. Thanks so much. Well, uh, maybe the maybe he doesn't know that this is a very, very hot issue that's being debated, but seems to be coming to a resolution, and the resolution is not in favor of the claims that were made originally. But we can deal with that at some point. And we may actually, didn't you say that we may have uh, uh, Rosie Redfield come yeah. join us and tell yeah, us fact, what she's done about it? I have, I have asked Dr. Redfield to join us. She's happy to do so. We'll just schedule it, and Josh, you will hear it. Uh, so stay tuned. It's coming up. All right, that will do it for this episode of TWIM. You can find us at iTunes, the Zoom Marketplace, and at microworld.org slash TWIM. If you like TWIM, go on over to iTunes and uh, leave a review, a short review. will help us stay visible on the podcast uh, page there and, and have more people uh, able to discover us. Uh, you can also get an app for streaming TWIM to your smartphone or your Android device or your iPhone. You can find that at microworld.org. And, of course, we love to get your questions and comments and corrections. Send them to twim at twiv.tv. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered, the wonderful blog that you must check out. Thank you, Elio, for joining my us. My pleasure, my pleasure, of course. Always happy to have you. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent. It's been a... Uh... A, a learning experience yet once again. Always the case. That's partly why we do it, of course. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'm very grateful to the American Society for Microbiology for supporting TWIM. And I'd like to thank Communications Director Barbara Hyde and Chris Condian and Ray Ortega for their help. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.